Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity of uh, sharing a few thoughts with you. I'd rather like to give a sort of strategic overview of regulation. But before I begin, could I say that um, any views that I express do not necessarily represent those of the European Banking Authority or the Banking Stakeholder Group of which I am Vice Chair. And rather like Patrick, I think I can go even further than that and say they definitely do not represent the views of either of those two uh, agencies. We have been through and are going through one of the biggest crises, banking crises ever. And this in turn is leading to one of the biggest ever changes in the regulatory regime, right the way across the board. Therefore, there's no doubt that a major review of regulation is needed. And I won't go through all of these bullet points, uh, but this really outlines quite obviously uh, why that is the case. But I would just mention a couple, if I may. Bullet point number two, there is a perversity in the pre-crisis arrangements. And that perversity was that when things go well, the banks keep the profits. When things go badly, the taxpayer takes up the cost. There must be something fundamentally wrong with the taxpayer, in effect, acting as an insurer of last resort. And that was based on a very, un very inefficient definition of insurance. It was what we call ex post insurance. I wonder if you've ever tried this. Go to an insurance company and ask for compensation when your house has burnt down, but have to admit, well, actually, I haven't paid any premiums. I think you know exactly what the insurance company would say. But that's exactly the position that the taxpayer has been in. The taxpayer has paid out, but I don't remember, as a taxpayer, ever receiving any insurance premium for the uh, institutions that the taxpayer bailed out. So for quite clear, there is something fundamentally wrong that, that needed to be addressed. The key issue is, are we addressing it in the right way? Everything seems to be falling apart today. <laughs> Quite clearly, we are at a turning point. We've moved from a regime where there was a faith in markets, as, as Patrick was, uh, was hinting at. <coughs> Limited regulation. The soft touch approach. <coughs> you must excuse me, I have a chest infection. It's not contagious, so you don't have to leave. What we're now doing, the pendulum has swung. And we're now going back to faith in regulation. Faith in markets didn't seem to work. Now we have faith in regulation. I think we have to ask the question, are we doing this in the right way? Well, quite clearly, regulation and supervision did not prevent the crisis. So we can't argue that there was no regulation or supervision before the crisis. There was, but it didn't work. Therefore, the two fundamental questions we have to... Well, the fundamental question we have to ask is, why did it not work? And I'll give you two possible alternatives. One, it was just inefficient. There were certain fault lines in the way we did it. And therefore, all we need to do is to improve upon that. Basel I gave way to Basel II. That didn't work. We'll give way to Basel III. So one possibility is all we need to do is eventually get to Basel N, the perfect regulation that will actually work. And therefore, what we're doing at the moment is striving for that perfection. I just don't believe that. The second possibility is that the whole methodology and strategy is wrong and that we really need to fundamentally rethink the whole regulatory regime and our approach. So what I'd like to do, I've got a lot of slides here, but I will only go through really slide number one to give you the, the major summary bullet points of my presentation. Let me say that there is a long paper available. If there are any masochists in the audience that want to have a further development of my argument, please feel free to, to write to me. I'll gladly send it to you. So what is really the, what am I trying to put to you today? Point number one. We have two key objectives. <coughs> we forget this. The first objective, and I'm going to call it objective one, 
is to reduce the probability of bank failures. That's what Basel, etc., is all about. Objective number two, however, given that we'll never get perfection in objective one, and indeed we don't want perfection in objective one, we do want banks to fail. I can actually devise a regulatory regime, as can everybody in this room, that will guarantee that no bank will ever go bust again. Capital ratios of 80%, 70% liquidity holdings, well, you, you know the story. What we would have then is a perfectly safe banking system, and we'd have a perfectly useless banking system. Therefore, there always will be failures. Therefore, it seems to me, the second objective, let's call it objective two, what can we do to reduce the cost when banks fail? And in particular, what can we do to protect the taxpayer from being forced to act as an insurer of last resort on the basis of a very inefficient insurance contract? Secondly, there is a, there is a trade-off. I think somebody's trying to tell me something here, but... There is a trade-off between these two objectives in the sense that, just imagine, suppose through resolution arrangements, living wills, etc., suppose we could reduce the social cost of bank failure to zero. There just weren't any um, costs associated with bank failure. Well, certain implications would follow from that. We wouldn't care if banks failed. Actually, we wouldn't need any regulation. There wouldn't be any bailouts. There'd no, be no moral hazard attached to any bailouts. Well, of course, this is an Alice in Wonderland world. Of course, we can't reduce the cost of bank failures to zero. What my argument is, however, we can reduce it. And therefore, my argument is that there is a trade-off. The more that we can reduce the cost of those banks that fail, the less we need be concerned about regulation for objective one. The skill, in my view, is linking those two objectives. Third bullet point. One of the problems is we had no proper resolution arrangements before the crisis. Very few countries had clearly defined explicit resolution arrangements before the crisis. In other words, resolution arrangements. What do you do with failed or failing banks? Incidentally, I was doing some work a little while ago in Norway. Of course, Norway didn't go through the banking crisis anywhere near to the extent that many other countries did. And one of the things that they told me was, and that's because we went through it in the early 1990s, we learnt the lessons of not having proper resolution arrangements. We learnt the lessons of not um, addressing the problem of how to reduce the costs of bank failures. <coughs> Optimal regulation for objective one. I suspect most of our discussion today will be on objective one. Basel, capital, liquidity, how to reduce the probability of bank failure. My argument here, however, is that you can't talk about that until you know what the arrangements are for objective two. So the optimal level of regulation for objective one depends on how far can you go in reducing the cost of bank failure. Therefore, we need, in my view, a holistic or what I call a strategic reform agenda. We've got to look at both objectives simultaneously. How to reduce probability, how to reduce cost. Why is this important? Well, if I may just develop very slightly um, a, a very powerful point that, that Patrick made in his first uh, introduction. What I call the endogeneity problem. And what I mean by that is that problems that, that the regulator is trying to address are actually endogenous to regulation itself. And the simple reason is, as Patrick argued, because banks will always respond to whatever the regulation is at the moment. Regulation arbitrage. By definition, the regulator, supervisor, will always be behind the curve. Not because the supervisor is inefficient or stupid, but simply because wherever you are at the moment, banks will respond to it. And this leads to a major problem that you get regulatory escalation. 
you regulate to d deal with problem one, you then banks try to get around that, you regulate to get around that problem, and so you get a Christmas tree effect that regulation gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That is why you will never solve the objective one problem. And that is why I think we have to be very humble about how far we believe you can engage regulation to deal with objective one. Therefore, I think this endogeneity problem that both Patrick and I have mentioned, in my view, leads to the inevitable conclusion that what we need to be doing is actually giving much more emphasis to objective two, the resolution arrangements. But more, I'm not saying for one minute that you don't need regulation for objective one. Of course I'm not. What I am saying is that we need to integrate the two.